Hey everybody, this is the Guided Trip Fly Fishing Podcast, Episode 3. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to let everybody know that we do have the email set up, theguidedtrip at gmail.com. And I also want to thank Sam Pankratz and Jenny Hill for helping us out for our intro and outro music. Thanks guys. What's happening, everybody? Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking about winter nymphing techniques. Um, And we're going to discuss a lot of, I mean, basic nymphing techniques as well. But I'm going to go into just a little bit of kind of winter, spring, since we're getting close to spring, and how you want to be nymphing and what areas you're going to be targeting, um, and kind of basically how to set up the nymph rig, in my opinion. Um, And like I said, this is strictly my opinion. You can do it however you'd like. but this is the way I like to do it. Um, I like to start with basic five or six weight. I fish, you know, um, pretty stiff rods or fast action rods, um, just because I like the, the action of it. Um, and I can, for, for the way I fish, it, it works pretty well for me. Um, and you can use your, your basic, you know, floating line as well. Um, that is going to work for that five or six weight that you're fishing. Um, you know, a lot of lines these days that you buy for fast action rods are going to be a half weight heavy, which is good. Um, you know, I, I usually buy scientific angler, um, depending on, you know, what I'm looking for, either the GPX or the MPX taper. Um, but most of those are going to be a half weight heavy for the fast action rods. When I'm going to build a leader, I'm going to start with a butt section of leader and then I'm going to add tip it onto that. And usually what I'll do is I'll take maybe a three foot section of, of leader. Um, like I said, that butt section or that thickest section. And I'll use that part because I can move my indicator up and down on that part a little bit easier than if I add tip it to it. Um, so then what I'll do is I'll either take one or two X tip it and I'll tie that in with a blood knot. Um, and I continue to taper down from there for, the size that I'm looking for of the leader. Um, and I'll use double surgeons knots all the way down pretty much. So if I tie one X onto my leader or onto that butt section of leader, then my next section I'm going to tie on is going to be two. And my next session will be three from there on. Um, and usually in the winter I'll fish to my first fly four X and then to my second fly, I'll fish five X depending on the situation where I'm at. Um, and the reason you taper down like that from four to five X for your flies is because if you're to hook up on bottom or hook up on a log or a rock or something like that, you do want these breaking points. You want to be able to break off that five X fly and not your four and not the whole rig. You don't want to break off your five X fly and your four X fly. Um, here in Colorado, you can only fish three flies. I usually only fish two. That's just the way I like to go. It's easier for me. And honestly, if I'm throwing three, it's just a mess. Um, for most people, it's a mess. You can do it and I'll do it occasionally, but I'll throw, you know, pretty light flies, maybe two midges with a worm or an egg or something like that. Um, so just be careful when you start adding more and more flies on there. Um, so you can definitely start with one, but like I said, I start with two and go four X to the first one and five X to the next one, depending on what I'm using. Um, and in that aspect, I also use four and five X fluorocarbon when I get down to my flies, just because it is the winter. Um, the water is a little bit clearer. The fish are definitely a little bit spookier. Um, and fluoro is going to be a little bit stiffer than your regular nylon. And it's generally less visible, um, obviously because it's fluorocarbon and it's going to sink quicker. So when you're using a nymph rig, I like to use the fluoro. It definitely helps, um, especially in the winter for the visibility, um, just because it gets down in the zone a little bit quicker. And also the reason why we're using this whole tippet rig, um, you know, where I'm tapering down using tippet instead of buying a pre-built leader, um, is because I can adjust my sections as well, but it's going to, it's going to sink a lot quicker than using a regular tapered leader that you'd buy from the store. There's a lot more surface area on those leaders. And in my opinion, it takes a lot longer for the flies to get down in the zone. So I like to either use what pretty much what we're calling a 90 degree rig or tip it to tip it, um, leader that I've, I've built, um, just because I like to get in the zone quicker and I like to be right there. 
So the issue most people are going to have with fluorocarbon tippet is that it is more expensive than mono or nylon tippet. Um, and I understand that completely. Um, and I don't use fluoro all year long, but I will use it a lot um, on my nymph rigs and occasionally on hopper dropper rigs. But what I'll do is I'll, I usually buy the Rio Fluoroflex guide spool. Um, it's 110 yards, about 40 bucks, depending on where you go. Um, and they also have a 30 yard one for about $15. And that usually lasts me a, a fair amount of time because I don't go through the fluoro that much, like I said. Um, and then for the, for the mono that I use, I usually buy scientific angler, just personal preference. That's what I like. Um, and I'll buy that all the way from zero X to four and five X. I usually don't go low, don't go below, excuse me. Um, 5x just because I don't really see the need for 6x um, and that's also my personal opinion and then I usually use a standard thingamabobber um, medium to large depending on the weight that you use um, I like to use you know I will use white occasionally but I like to use something I can see um, I have a lot of people that give me shit for it but you know I you know it's easier to see in the sun it's easier to see any in riffles if it's pink or if it's orange or something like that. Um, and I'll also throw the big thing mabobber during high water or if I'm using, you know, three BBs or something like that because I like to be able to see my takes as well and I don't want my flies dragging down that medium to small indicator all day. So I throw on that big beach ball occasionally and, yeah, I get laughs and people make fun of me, but, you know, honestly, I don't care. If I can see it and it's doing the trick, then why should I care what people are thinking about it? Um, so start with the medium, you know, like I said, depending on what um, type of weight or how much weight you're using. And then if you need to, if you're adding up weight or you just can't see it or maybe it's too fast of water or too deep of water or something, go with the big indicator. It'll definitely help you out. When I set up these nymph rigs, I usually start with a standard depth of about five to six feet or so to my last fly. Um, and then I'll change it um, depending on how it's fishing or how I like it. And that's just, again, that's just how I like to start. Um, I feel comfortable with that size of rig and I feel comfortable casting it. So I'll start, like I said, about five to six feet to my first fly or sorry, my last fly. And then so on from there. Um, if I need to change the depth a little bit, I have ran into a fair amount of clients that like to fish the yarn indicator rig. That's fine. Um, you know, it is going to be on you about maintaining that because I hate the maintenance of it. Um, you, at that point, you know, to me, you might as well be fishing a chubby Chernobyl. Um, it's the same material, you know, throw a hopper dropper at that point um, because you just can't cast that type of weight with a large nymph rig on the yarn indicator. At least I don't believe so. Um, I like the thing, Mabobber, it kind of weighs it out a little bit and balances that leader and balances your cast out. Um, and there's not a whole lot of, there's no maintenance really to the thing Mabobber, and that's the best thing about it. So it is really easy, especially for people who have never done it before. Get into that, grab a couple of thingamabobbers in different sizes and colors and check it out. And then you can start to venture out just a little bit and try different things for more picky or particular trout or different situations where you can go to a yarn indicator or um, even a cork or even smaller thingamabobber or something like that. Um, so definitely research a little bit and try out some different things. All right, so now that we got our leader set up, um, let's talk about what we do with our split shot. Uh, depending on how much weight you want to use and what kind of split shot you use, um, it is all up to personal preference, up to you. Um, I usually start with two BBs or two ABs, I believe they're called. And what I'll do is I'll try, I'll go from my 3X to my 4X, I'll use a double surgeon's knot, and then I'll put my BBs right above that knot so that they don't slide down to my first fly. And I'll do that first fly about 16 to 18 inches from my split shot. And that seems to work well for me. Um, gets everything down quick and in the zone, like I said. Um, and that technique is different because not a lot of people have seen that, um, where you do tie that knot in there. And I have had clients, I've, I've ran into a lot of buddies too who have never seen that. You know, they'll take a full leader, they'll buy a 9 or 10 foot leader, and then they'll tie their first fly on and add their weight. And throughout the day, if they're casting a lot, that split shot seems to drop all day. And it'll continue to slide down to that first fly. And so I just like to put that knot in there. Um, 
just so that doesn't happen. Even if I buy a leader and pull it out of the package or somebody has a, a client pulls out a leader, Hey, I got a nine foot three X, um, you know, perfect. All right. I'll cut off that first, you know, 18 inches and then tie it back on with the double surgeons just to make sure if we are nymphing that the split shot doesn't slide. Um, and that'll help you a lot. And that's just a little trick and a little tip. So now let's talk about how to set up those flies. Um, what I like to do is my lead or my point fly is usually the largest and heaviest. Um, I have seen people do it other ways. I have a buddy I used to float with constantly, um, and it would drive me nuts how he would rig his nymph rig. And I, I absolutely couldn't stand it, and we'd butt heads all day. Um, but what he would do is he would usually tie his smallest fly in first. Well, he'd have his split shot, and then he'd tie his smallest fly in first, and then he would tie his largest fly with the most weight at the bottom. Um, and it's a lot like a bounce rig, if you've ever heard of that, where basically you have your, your flies tied in to your leader, and then you're going to tie off your last fly and put split shot below it. And that way, that split shot drags along the bottom, and then your flies are just barely off the stream bed. And that's it does work for some people. And the way he would rig it is a lot like that, but it wasn't for me. I couldn't stand it. Um, and I like to have a little bit shorter rig where my weight's up top and I get to feel those flies just a little bit more. There's just a little bit more sensitivity, in my opinion, to that rig where I can feel certain ticks or if I want to high stick or even drag those flies just a little bit, I can feel the flies a little bit more rather than that weight bouncing on the bottom. I know my flies are getting close. My flies are going to be bouncing on the bottom, which is the way I like it. Um, definitely if you're fishing emergers or other aspects, uh, that bounce rig could help you out for sure and bring those flies just up off the bed of the, of the river a little bit. And that's uh, people like that. That's personal preference. Um, I can't fucking stand it. It's obnoxious to me. Um, so this is like, I keep saying, and I'm going to continue to say, because I'm sure people are going to light me up for it. This is the way I like to rig it. If you don't like it, do something else, try it a different way, but this has worked for me. All right. So I touched on it just a little bit in the intro podcast, but for my winter rigs, like I said, usually I'll start out with that worm or egg as my point fly, um, 18 inches below the split shot. Lately, I've been throwing the egg on there. Um, you can run trout bead style or you can run a classic yarn egg. Um, I fish the trout bead style. Again, it's the way I like it. Um, and then I'll take a piece of 18 inch 5X fluoro and I'll add on a little midge or, or an emerger depending on what's going on. Lately, I've been throwing a zebra midge um, in various colors, black, white, you know, with silver ribbing. And that's been doing pretty good. Weight has also been an issue lately. Um, you know, being in Gunnison here, water's a little bit different this year. We haven't had a lot of snow, so things are constantly changing And the way I'm, or the, excuse me, where I'm fishing, um, everything's constantly changing in the river and there's a lot of different shelves opening up. And so what I like to do is I like to target those winter positions where the fish are going to hang out. Um, I'm going to target the deep shelves. I'm going to target deep runs. And so with that, the weight can be a little bit of an issue. If you have too much length between your indicator and your weight, sometimes it feels like you don't have the sensitivity. You can't feel what's going on. So what I'll do a little bit, instead of changing that up right off the bat, what I'll do is I'll make that first cast in. I'll let those flies drop. I'll be able to feel bottom. And then what I do is I tight line it just a little bit to drag it just a tad to be able to feel those flies. That way I know what's going on. Because if you're fishing a shelf where it drops off really quick and there's some turbulent water in there. Occasionally what will happen is you'll cast in to the top of that shelf. Your flies will drop and then they might catch up or sorry, excuse me. They might pass your indicator because that current is moving a little bit quicker and it's a little bit more turbulent underneath the surface of what you're seeing, where what your indicator is doing. And you'll go to set that hook or move it. And what will happen is those flies will be ahead and you'll set that hook and you'll go, whoa, something ain't right here. So what I like to do is I'll cast into the top of that shelf or I'll shorten my rig just a little bit and I'll move my indicator downstream of my flies. So my indicator's moving downstream. My flies are a little bit more upstream. That way I can pull those flies along the bottom and I know they're getting down because I'm pulling them down. Um, otherwise, 
it's going to be really hard for you to set that hook. So that's where the sensitivity comes in. That's where this tippet rig comes in because those flies are going to drop really quick and you have to move that indicator just a little bit in certain situations on those big shelves. Otherwise, what I'm doing, if I'm fishing those big, deep, long runs where those fish are going to hang out in the winter, I'm going to be able to cast to the top of that run. I'm going to let the flies drop to the bottom. I'm going to make the mins depending on what situation I'm in. And I'm going to let that drift naturally for the most part. And what I like to do occasionally is when I make my mins, I like to pull my indicator downstream a little bit when I make my mend. And that's a little bit easier said than done. And some of you might be going, what the hell is he talking about by doing that? But when I make that first mend, if I'm mending to my upstream side, I'm going to pull my line just a little bit downstream just to make sure that that indicator is constantly a little bit further downstream than my flies. And then I make that mend. Because if those flies start catching up and moving ahead of that indicator, you're not going to be able to see that take very well. And I mean, as hard as it is to see takes sometimes when you're nymphing. So try to move that indicator just a little bit downstream to be able to make that mend. And that should be able to help you see some takes as well. And when we're setting that hook, we're always concentrating on a downstream hook set. And that might sound unfamiliar to you guys too. And this, you know, you're going, what, what downstream? I've never heard of a downstream hook set. I just set the hook. A lot of people get in the habit of setting the hook a certain way. So when I say a downstream hook set, if I'm following that indicator with my rod tip, I make my mins, everything's good. I'm going to, when I go to set that hook, I'm going to try and concentrate on pulling my rod to the downstream side and setting that hook. Because if I go and I pull that hook upstream, if I set to the upstream side, most likely, not in all situations, but most likely you're going to pull those flies out of that fish's mouth. And by setting to the downstream side, you're going to increase hookups. So whether you're on the left or the right side of the river, depending on where you're fishing, concentrate on that downstream hook set. It'll change your game. I've ran into a lot of people who have fished 30, 40 years, you know, on the boat. They've never heard that in their life. What do you mean a downstream hook set? I don't, and you explain it, you go, doesn't that make sense? And they go, well, yeah, it makes sense. Well, then do it. And that's going to help you. Um, so concentrate on that really hard. And that's a tough one. I remember when I first started doing that, that was a very tough thing to wrap my brain around because I was just setting the hook. Either way, you know, I was setting it up, I was setting it upstream, it didn't matter. Um, and that's just for the nymph rig. A little bit different when you're, you know, if you're fishing a hopper dropper or something like that, those hook sets are going to change. But we're talking nymphing right now. So every time you set that hook, if you're doing it, downstream, downstream, downstream. That same buddy I was talking about who would be on the boat and he'd be fishing this crazy fucked up nymph rig, you'd tell him all day, hey, downstream hook set downstream hook set and he'd give you this filthy look and you go dude you're missing all your fish and he fish would come unbuttoned all day all day and i just sit there and go downstream downstream and finally i looked at him and go how many times do i have to tell you before you change it before this helps and apparently i had to do it all goddamn day because it never changed hopefully to this day i haven't fished with him in a while um hopefully to this day it's changed and he's able to get that downstream hook set, but it was pretty tough there for a while. So definitely concentrate on that. That's a big game changer for most people. I ventured a little bit off topic there, but so you have your egg set up or your worm set up with a midge or an emerger, depending on what you want to fish and what's going on there and what's working, you know, match the hatch is what everybody says, but a lot of midges will come off during the winter. Um, especially if that water temperature gets up a little bit and the sun's out, those midges start coming up. Um, so concentrate on those flies a little bit. And I did talk about earlier in the first podcast too, if they aren't touching your rig, when you have a worm or an egg on it, change it up, try something new, maybe try, you know, purple prince nymph, or maybe try two midges or maybe trying to midge in a merger. Because a lot of the times, if you know they're in a certain run, if you go, Hey, I know there's fish here. I've seen fish here. I know they're eating and they won't touch it with an egg on take or worm on take it off get rid of it because a lot of times it just spooks them um you know they might be a little bit get bit confused as to what's going on of course it's a big meal coming down the river but you know a lot of fish have seen that rig um depending on where you go a lot of people fish this rig during the winter and they're gonna go nope don't want that there's a spot here in gunnison where a lot of people fish during the winter and it's great it's usually great fishing um past couple weeks it's been really tough 
and going in there, you know, we'd have, I'd have a worm or an egg on and I'd start fishing. And for a couple hours, you wouldn't catch anything and go, what the, what the hell is going on? I understand it's got a lot of pressure, but all of a sudden you take that egg off, you take the worm off, boom, 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 boom. You start rip snorting again. So think about it just a little bit. If you know they're there and you're, you got confidence in your position, where you're at and how you're fishing it, maybe change that egg, change that worm up. Um, and that should help you out. So now let's say from there, you change your flies, you feel confident in your flies, you're catching a few fish, you know, boom, boom, catch a couple. And all of a sudden it turns off and you keep fishing, you keep fishing. You're not sure what's going on. Occasionally in the winter, that'll happen. But what I usually look to first, if I know, if I'm confident in my rig, if I know it's going to catch fish, I'm confident in my area. What I usually do is I change my weight. I usually add more weight because what'll happen is I'm in there's an old saying, and I, I honestly can't remember who said it. I, I feel like it's Pat Dorsey, but there's a difference between a good fisherman and a bad fisherman. And that's one more split shot. So if you add that one more split shot, it, it can make the difference. The other day I was out fishing the Gunnison and caught a couple fish in one hole that's very likely hole. Um, and I knew they weren't spooked on my rig. Rig was working well. And so what I did is I changed my indicator. I threw on a bigger indicator. And I added one more big split shot. And that way I can fish that heavy current that I was fishing with a bigger indicator. And I know I don't have to worry about it. And then I threw the split shot on and all of a sudden it was boom, 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 boom. Started catching fish again. And all it took was that one split shot. So think about that too. Think about confidence in your rig, confidence in your spot. If you're not catching fish, if you have those two things going for you, change your weight. Um, Add one more split shot and see what happens. Sometimes it might be a little bit too much and you can decide and decipher from there. Maybe you go in between. Um, but that one more weight can decide and make or break your day right there. I'll tell you what I need. I need a fact checker on that one. <clears throat> might have been Pat Dorsey who said that. I can't remember. Maybe I'm just giving him credit for some quote I've heard. Um, but... If you know who said that, if you know that quote, um, shoot me an email. That way we can get it figured out and give the credit to who it's due. Um, so we did touch a little bit on how to set the hook, you know, the downstream hook set. Um, but now let's talk about when to set the hook. Of course, you're going, well, duh, Cameron, when that indicator goes underwater like a bobber. Yeah, you're bobber fishing, but not always will that indicator shoot underwater. Um, hopefully it does. That's the easiest way to, you know, of course, indicate that a fish is eating it, or maybe it's dragging on bottom, or maybe it grabs something. Um, so as everybody says, you know, set on everything. I tell everybody, you know, you might as well set hook sets are free, you know, set on everything. You never know until you set the hook, which is, I believe is fully true, but there are certain aspects, you know, as you start to fish more and pick up different tips or sorry excuse me different techniques you're going to find out that you don't have to set on necessarily everything especially if you're fishing a run and you know you know hey there's a rock there hey there's a big big stick up there or something like that or you know hey it it's going to drag before it drops off into this dish or something then you don't have to set on it all and pull it out of the water and cast again um, try to pick up on those little subtleties that the indicator will do when I was out the other day fishing I was fishing a big shelf and I was tight lining it a little bit, dragging it off the shelf and trying to feel the bottom, feel that indicator move. And occasionally it would just stop and you wouldn't really feel it. It would just pause and you'd set the hook. It necessarily, it didn't necessarily go underwater. Um, occasionally it would, you know, and of course you're going to sit on that, but it would just slight pause and you'd set that hook and boom, you'd have a fish on. So try to pick up on the subtleties of what that indicator does. If it moves off to the side in a real weird motion, set the hook. If it bounces up and down kind of quick, you know, set the hook. But you will be able to start to pick up on the subtleties. Um, like I said, right at the start, if you're doing it, set on everything. That way you get in the habit of making your downstream set. That way you get in the habit of how hard you should set the hook. And we're not Bassmaster setting here. Uh, these are trout. You know, we're not trying to set off car alarms in the parking lot every time you set the hook, all right? So keep that in mind as well. I, I set harder than most, um, and I get, I get a lot of flack for that. But definitely keep that in mind. You don't have to set it super hard where you're going to rip that fish's lip right off. Um, and I mean, that's where that term comes from, ripping lips pretty much is setting it so hard. Um, 
So, like I said, pick up on some subtleties and understand what that indicator is doing at certain moments in time. Um, and as you get to fishing more, you're going to be able to pick up on that, and it's going to get easier. Another little trick that I like to teach people with that hook set, especially out of the boat, it works well. Um, when you set that hook to that downstream side, you know, in the front of the boat, it works well. In the back, it's a little bit tougher, with a nymph rig at least. But when you set the hook to the downstream side, you can almost turn that in back into a cast and make it a back cast. So if you set that hook and pull those flies out of the water, if you got a big heavy nymph rig on, focus on that back cast, pause, and flop it right back down as if you were making a forward cast. And that's a, an easy way to do that hook set. Boom, downstream side, pause, and just shoot it right back forward, and you'll be able to be back in the water in no time. Um, occasionally what I do too is I'll set that hook and pull that indicator, move that indicator, and try and move those flies. And if there's something there, great, boom, fish on. If not, I just leave it. I leave it right where it's at, and that way it can continue its drift. And I can correct that indicator as well and pull it to that downstream side when I do set that hook. And that way I know for the rest of that drift, it's going to be in right position where the flies are going to be upstream of that indicator and you'll be able to detect the strike. Okay, so now that we've got our rig figured out, we got our position, we're catching fish now, um, we know how to set the hook. we got to talk about it because it's constantly, it constantly needs to be brought up is the safe handling of fish during the winter. And it's a big thing. And if we don't take care of these fish, then we're not going to have them for very much longer. So winter is, poses a big risk to fly fishing because, and well, the fish in general, because if we're pulling fish out of the water and we're exposing them to this cold air, especially here in Gunnison, where it can definitely drop below freezing and be very cold, it can hurt their soft tissues like their eyes and their gills. And so we want to try and keep them in the net as much as possible right after we catch them. Um, easiest ways to keep them in the net and use forceps to try and get the hook out. And that way you don't have to touch them and expose them to us. Um, so keep that in mind, especially if you're taking pictures, keep them as net as much as possible. It doesn't take long to hold the fish up, take your snap, put it back in the net and it's back on its way. If you're wearing gloves, which I personally don't like to wear gloves all the time, but sometimes I have to, if it's too cold, try to take those gloves off to handle the fish and wet your hands. Um, if you're wearing gloves and you're just grabbing the fish, I mean, think about that. That's uh, first of all, that's disgusting. Cause that's going to sit in your truck and it's going to smell like nasty, rotten fish. Um, after a couple of days, if the heat blown or if you put them on your defroster, so take the gloves off, wet your hands, handle the fish, put the fish back in the net and release it. Do what you got to do. That way we don't pull that protective layer off the fish, especially with gloves on. You're going to pull that protective layer of slime off the fish, which helps them you know, keep the fungi away, keeps the bacteria away, and it keeps them healthy. Um, so definitely think about that. What Sometimes what I'll do is I'll bring a microfiber towel or something like that and keep it in my waders or, you know, hang it right off my waiter belt in front. And that way, once I wet my hands, I release the fish, I'll wet them, clean them, and I'll rub it on the towel. Towel's a lot easier to wash and take care of than, you know, maybe some expensive fishing gloves. So keep that in mind when you're handling these fish. I know that sounds like a PSA for, you know, the safe handling of fish, but we have to throw it out there. Um, there's a lot of knuckleheads out there who don't want to handle fish the right way and they want to mistreat them. Um, now, I wouldn't say they want to mistreat them. They just don't necessarily know. They're maybe a little bit ignorant to the situation and don't know how to do it. So we got to bring it up. Um, but keep that in mind when you're handling fish at all times. Um, so during this podcast, we talked about rigging, um, rigging a leader, building a leader, how I build a leader, um, my personal opinion of how to do it. We talked about how to add weight, where to add weight, when to add weight. We also talked about indicators. We talked about how to set the hook, when to set the hook. And we talked some about some bugs for winter fishing and how I like to fish them. So keep all these tips and tactics in mind um, while nymphing. They don't necessarily just apply to the winter season. They apply to all seasons. You can nymph all year round. And, you know, I, I do like to nymph a lot of the time um, because m a lot of the fish will eat on bottom and you do have some better chances with nymphing. So nymphing, yeah, it can get boring and not a, people, not a lot of people like to do it, but um, it's, a good, it's a good way to catch fish. Um, and I do like the techniques that I've described to you guys today. I do think so, a lot of them are basic te techniques, but um, 
keep those in mind. Uh, they are very useful and they will help you out throughout the season. That's going to wrap up episode three of the guided trip podcast. I want to thank everybody for joining us and keep joining us. And I look forward to the next one. Thanks guys.